All right, welcome to the CES meeting. Today's December 7th of 2022. Um, last week was plenary. So today we have a light agenda. We uh, can discuss outcomes and plans for steps going forward based off of our feedback from last week. Um, Alex presented mass proxy revocation. Um, I presented an overview of the module harmony effort, and there were four related presentations after that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, and and notably, um, we have some work to do to get uh, to 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 try again for advancement on um, on modules layer zero and uh, a number of other things. But let's uh, let's kick off with Alex. Well, and also, uh, plenary was Carrie's presentation of the updates to Shadow Realm, um, which included uh, the error stack censoring, which didn't pass. Yeah, vehemently rejected, as I recall. Yes. Okay. Um, well, since uh, Chris wants me to start off, um, First thing I'll say is that, yes, for the record, we did get um, proposal mass ratification to stage one. Yay. Um, got a bit of pushback from the actual engines. Um, and the pushback was a little bit interesting in that both Google and Microsoft felt the, uh, felt the feature was too small, meaning that proxies were way off in the, in the weeds. Um, and Microsoft thought it was too big in that um, he saw some, uh, Ron Buckton from Microsoft saw some overlap between um, my proposal on mass rep proxy revocation and the disposable stack part of the explicit resource management proposal. And I talked to him on uh, the TC39 chat room and asked him if he might be interested in joining these meetings to talk about it further. And I and he said he was he was generally interested, but I don't know when or if he has an invitation to join us here. So feel I free. also found. I'm feel sorry. Free. Feel free to extend our invitation. Okay. Um, remind me after this meeting offline about that, please, Chris. I think um, that 10 a.m. was a difficult time for him on Wednesday, but uh, that he could try. Okay, I, I just need a reminder later. Um, as a result of that conversation, I filed a couple more issues on the repository now that it's been transferred to TC39. One of them asking explicitly about um, overlap between explicit resource management and mass proxy revocation. And the other was a question which, off the top of my head, I'm forgetting. Give me one moment. Ah, I, the second one I filed was about other use cases for proxy revocation in general. Um, I threw out CHAI assertions, C-H-A-I. Um, I don't think that's a use case here because those are basically throwaway proxies. Use once and, and forget about them. But I just wanted to make sure we started capturing some of these use cases to strengthen the argument going back to TC39. Again, my, my takeaway was there's a lot of pushback from the engines as to is this worth it? I strongly believe it is and that they just haven't had a chance to really dive into it. But that is just my opinion. And I'm done talking for now. All right. So the feedback was interesting. So I, I guess one of the pushback we got was are revocable proxies actually used outside of membranes? Uh, that's what I understand, right? And so that's why you're trying to uh, figure out use cases that are there outside of membranes. Yeah. Um, the tie-in with resource management is interesting. My main concern is, uh, technically that could work today. Uh, my main concern is this would be a magical uh, optimization that engines would we would somehow rely on them doing. Um, so so basically the idea is that like you would pass the revoke uh, you put we put the revoke function in um, uh, 
in a disposable stack. Uh, you, so you, you could even like take the revoke function, pass it across a callable boundary and put it in a single revocable stack on a, in a single place. Uh, but that does require the implementation to realize that specific uh, use, that specific dispose function that's being added to the disposable stack is an internal one and optimized for that case, which not ideal. Which means me dubious it will ever happen, especially because it's related to proxies and they don't like implementations don't don't optimize proxies. Right. I've put a link to the after to the issue I filed uh, in the chat here. So if anyone wants to take a look at it while we're talking about this. Um, It's of course no never too early to become prepared, but I suspect that this proposal comes at a time when it is too early. Because one, um, I mean, if I think that uh, like the objection that proxies aren't used much uh, and that membranes are used less, um, I think that that argument would not hold as much water if the one website that used them were Gmail, for example. <laughs> and um, so, so like, I think that, it is, so here's a question, is the lack of mass proxy revocation a performance limitation that precludes adoption of membranes in general? Um, because if something we're using, if there were if there were a number of platform websites like Salesforce is using membranes, um, eventually that becomes a compelling argument, regardless of like if there if there's a small number of but very important use cases that might help make the case. The other reason I think it's a little bit early, um, and it's fine to be early to stage one. You can be at stage one for ten years. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, the, the other is that, yeah, I think that we need to get the, we do need the ducks to align between, um, uh, disposal, uh, the automatic disposal features that Ron is working on and the cancellation token that Ron has previously proposed. Um, I think that once those features of the language exist, then it's time to go use and to exploit them pervasively. And it, when it, when that time happens, I think that there's less, there would be less resistance to having mass revocation on a proxy simply because it makes sense given that cancellation is a feature of the language that is, that is intended to be idiomatic um, in much the same way that having the abort controller on the web has infected every applicable web API. So, yeah, in that case, having this proposal at stage one is good because it would uh, motivate uh, the can cancellation token proposal uh, and also uh, provide a specific use case. But from what I remember from the presentation, uh, it's slightly different because it has different requirements, especially around um, synchronicity, right? Which, and, and also from what I remember from the cancellation token proposal, it still relies on the host to implement the behavior or there is some host hook that i i'm not quite sure about anymore but uh it's not a hundred percent uh ecma 262 spec right my comments on, so comments on what uh, chris was saying so, uh, so so even in, in a membrane implementation and you, you could also see the similarities with iframes, uh, for example. Um, there is not a desire to cancel the evaluation because cancel evaluation means for me like something that you will call and it will throw an error, or trying to access something that will throw an error or something like that. But in the case of iframes, they do have some prior art which is operations on DOM elements. Once you detach the iframe, you try to do an operation, it fails. 
uh, it fails because you detach the iframe and the iframe doesn't have an origin anymore. And it doesn't have all these things that are needed for the DOM to function. So it's a prior art, but at the same time, part of the um, code running in the iframe can continue to function if it is not accessing these things that are cancelable. Um, and people do not complain much about it. They don't care much about it. It's like very edge case, I would say. In the case of membrane, you can build a membrane that works kind of the same. Like you still, if you hold a reference to it, you can still do some stuff, but there's no decide to really cancel that, at least for us at software. Um, so I, I feel that, uh, yes, it is too early to say that this is going to be very useful in the future. As for whether or not proxies are used, that's just not true anymore because one of the most popular libraries out there, view use proxies for the reactivity model that they have. Like it's like how many people use view on the daily basis on a daily basis. So um so proxies are used uh, everywhere these days. You don't see them, but they're used everywhere. But at the same time, canceling those proxies is not a thing. Like re revoking a proxy is not a thing that people normally want to do. So again, like very edge. Carity, I'm gonna ask that you file an, a ticket on the uh on the on the repository, the proposal mass proxy revocation repository. Mm -hmm. Uh just file a ticket for to, for tracking purposes on view. I don't know anything about that library. Yeah. So I, I would appreciate that so I can follow up on that. Yeah. So um, view is using uh they build something very similar to what we build as at, at Salesforce. Uh, in fact, it's linked from there, which is what we call observable objects. And it's basically getting an object and putting a proxy around it. It's kind of a membrane. And then right. anything that you do on that object, you observe it. And that is the, the way they detect that you've changed something. So the UI has to be updated. And it's like, okay. as a reaction. Um, okay. And Chris, um, you did point out that it, it I do that this is not in any big hurry, and I agree with you on this. Um, I know it's my tendency. Okay, we got it here. Let's move on to the next thing. But that's not that's not realistic. I recognize that this is going to take a while for it not just to mature but to percolate through the through the community, and in particular the uh, browser engine. I'm sorry, the JavaScript engines that would be induced to implement this. So I don't want to take up the whole meeting with this. I just wanted to give a quick summary for the record. Um, and uh, Chris, I think I'd like to hand it off to somebody else. Cool. Uh, or another topic, unless there's somebody, unless there's further conversation that needs to happen on this right now. No, that sounds good. I just wanted to point out that Vue is one of those things. It's Vue is like Windows. It's pervasive everywhere but the Bay Area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I do have another topic, and I, I don't know Mark is not around today. Uh, we definitely need Mark for that one. It's it's time sensitive, I would say, which is the we need to provide at this time for sure. We need to provide a the explainer on how vendors implementers will decide what, whether or not an API should be included in a shadow realm or not. So we keep getting pushed back on that. That's the only remaining issue. So we need to really define that. It has to be well-defined. It has to be coherent. And so we can give it to them saying, whatever API you are not sure, just run it through this and you will know if it should be included or not. I'm curious what that means, but uh, I've dropped Mark him a note, and if he if he has time, he'll come. Um, yeah, apart from that, I can just briefly summarize uh, the conversations that the module harmony champions had yesterday. Uh, the yeah, the our intention as a group is to first attempt to address the feedback we received, particularly around attempting to go to stage two with a module and module source constructors, we're hoping that we can address. Uh, we're hoping that we can address the feedback that we received, uh, particularly from uh, Kevin Gibbons of Apple about having no new paths to eval uh, of arbitrary text. Um, 
we're hoping that we can address that by explaining in greater detail how we expect the intersection semantics of our proposals to look like in the presence of a content security policy. We th we are hoping that that will be satisfying. If it's not, we have a fallback position, and that would be to modify, uh, would, would be to uh, break the um, layer zero into two layers, one for the module constructor and one for module source, or simply move the module source uh, portion of the proposal into layer one. Um, at, and then in, in the module source proposal, we would have the option of shifting our stance from being um, a module source constructor to a module source parser that does not produce a thing you can construct. Um, that I think would satisfy most of the motivating use cases. Bundlers don't need to evaluate the things that they parse. Um, and if you do need to evaluate, you can always eval with a module block and or module expression, I should say. So it's it, it wouldn't be ideal. I think everybody everybody at the meeting um, on module harmony is in favor of keeping the proposals as they stand if we possibly can, and we just need to do a better better job next time we talk about presenting our module proposals together, seeking uh, seeking advancement together breadth first afterward, after we've given all of our presentations, because there's so much intersectionality among those proposals. It's not clear that uh, that they're holding each other up uh, unless we present them all together. Um, and yeah, so that that was that's where we stand. I see Sala's hand. Uh, yeah, sorry. I just I I have one question because I'm looking at the proposals on uh, on GitHub for TC thirty nine. Um, and I see module declarations and module expressions. And forgive me, I've been away from this for a very long time. And so I'm just trying to reconcile. Uh, you're saying mo module source, and uh, I, I can't even remember what the other word, uh, what the other uh, title was. Are those the same proposals you're referring to? or No, the compartments proposal, we, we've uh, probably since you last looked, we took the compartments proposal and then uh, broke it into four or five layers, and we're attempting to advance the earliest layers of that proposal, which would provide us with a, for a foundation for um, loading and linking modules from text. All right. So, um, can I, if there's a link to the proposal repo or something like that, could could we just throw it in the chat? Yep, of course. Thank you. Um, Those are still related. I mean, uh, the declarations and expressions and module uh, constructor and so on. Yeah, that was one of the other things that we decided is that we are going to actually fully embrace the notion of an epic uh, and that epic will include expressions and declarations as well as import reflection proposals. Um, and then we intend to eject layer zero into its own repository um, at some point. Uh, when we find the time. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sensitive that I've summoned Mark for a top for Carity's topic, and we have a Mark. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Hey, Mark. Um, so I was, I, was, I was asking, so the only remaining thing with respect to Shadow Realm is something that the implementers are asking for, which is an explainer with the details on how they can decide whether or not an API should be part of the um, of the Shadow Realm initialization. They want it in a, in a way that is a that is coherent, that is easy to understand, that they can run it by some of the APIs that they are not sure, and then they they can make the determination whether or not it should be included. Sorry, by, by APIs you mean let's say in, in particular level. In the browser case, which I suspect is the one motivating the question. Yeah, the DOM API. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. yeah. Apple and, and, and the rest from Google. Yeah. Right. And, and, by, and by API, what we really mean is uh, global names from the global object. Right. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if it, there is any API in the DOM similar to the ones that we have in the language where there is no global, but you can get access to an object 
Um, and then from there, you can access to a constructor that is not global. I don't know if they have that case. Is that what you're referencing to? Yeah, I mean, just the, the way I would, I, I mean, the way I've been thinking about what they want was all only in terms of the choice of for a given object that they're used to having on the um, the the non realm the, you know, the non shadow global um, uh, whether they want to choose to provide a a an, a similar object of the same name on the sh on the shadow global. Um, uh, you know, the starting point should be that, of course, er all the globals defined by the language, um, uh, unless we want, unless there's some that we want to make a special special case for. But in general, all the globals defined by the language, we do expect to be on the shadow globe. So the question is only with regard to globals beyond that, uh, and then for. I wouldn't expect that any host wants to put globals by default onto the shadow global that are not on the non-shadow global. So the issue is just what subset of the non-shadow global uh, glob globals they want to mirror onto the shadow global. Uh, my recommendation, of course, would be uh, zero, but I know that won't fly. Um, uh, so to give a more refined answer, I need to understand what the motivations are for, by which they want to include others onto the shadow and the, the, you know, and whether, you know, the simple alternative to zero is all of them. And is there any motivation for an answer other than zero or all of them? Right. So all of it cannot be because all of it means that the global object must be a, a, a window object, uh, a window proxy. I'm sorry, Kariti, you're, you're, I, I, I was not able to get, I was not able to get some of that audio. Can you start from the beginning? The, the, the answer to the all of it, um, I don't believe that that's possible because that's first, that's the thing that they have already. Uh, the only difference then will be that they all must be a forgeable, which is not the case of the main window, uh, but it will be effectively the same thing uh, in terms of features. And uh, additionally, most of the things that they have are uh, the DOM API specifically are based on the idea that you have this magical thing called the DOM and the window proxy that give you access to that DOM. And that does not exist in the shadow realm. So therefore, all these APIs that are DOM specific or UI specific will not be in the shadow realm. Like let's say global is the document or something like that. And therefore, yeah. all the TDs and all the paragraph and all these elements that are only useful, you have a document, then uh, you don't need them in the shadow realm. Okay, so the shadow realm does not have access to the browser window does not have access to the DOM. Um, it presumably uh, so, does have access to DOM APIs so it construct its own documents though. Is that correct? Correct. Probably. That's, that's correct. They don't, they don't have a way to create a document. Do they want a way to create a document? I don't think so. Oh, well then I'm perhaps wrong on that point. I would say that zero like having none of the web APIs inside of a shadow realm would be undesirable. There are a number I can think of immediately that would be nice. Text encoder, text decoder, URL. Okay. So for yeah, all even, of... even beyond that, console. Okay. Console uh, would be okay. good. Okay. Console, console is a fascinating example. Um, so, uh, but let, let's first of all, just take care of URL, text encoder, and text decoder. Um, the, I agree that those should be on the shadow realm. Uh, I agree that those should be on the shadow realm uh, because I agree that those should be on the global in all realms and should be in the language standard. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
the, I think there is a, a good explanation that you have about the Annex B and all the things around Annex B. I think there is not much uh, controversy around that. Yeah, and the fact that the that the semantics of text encoder is defined by standards documents outside of TC39 is fine. TC39 can in the in the TC39 standard in 262 we already reference other standards like Unicode. Uh, we can go ahead and define the global text encoder, text decoder, and URL, and then say the semantics of these objects are defined in that other standard over there. So the, 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 you know, that's, that's been the confusing argument that I think has held this up. If we want um, globals defined in other documents to be part of the JavaScript global environment, 262 can do that, and we should. It sounds to me like the follow-on from that would be, uh, the, the implication of that is that the Shadow Realm proposal uh, would, in, under, under this reasoning, um, be the place where we begin to bring these um, these non-262 standards explicitly into 262, that all JavaScript globals, including Shadow Realm globals, should include these things that are currently specified on the web, and that it would be an allow list. That's really good. Um, it's more than an allow list, it's a required list. Right. Can you articulate that again for me? So the idea would be that our answer to web vendors about what should be on the Shadow Realm Global that is currently only on the web would be that we make that very explicit in 262 with by in one on the one hand, we would add to 262 um all for example, URL text encoder, text decoder, A to B, B to A. Um these these libraries, we would add explicit references to them in 262 and possibly in an annex um, that these things must be on all JavaScript globals. And then in Shadow Realm, uh, the, the answer is you must have all JavaScript globals and nothing more. Yeah, that would, that would, I don't think that would be sufficient for them. Um, I, I think I pasted it a, a few days ago. I, I pasted some, some notes on it. Um, so. I see, I see three hands. Go ahead, Carity. Yeah, the, the, the issue, the issue go beyond specifying that list in 262. Um, I don't think the, the, the vendors or the implementers in this case are going to accept that the, the things that goes into the shadow realm must be somehow, even if it is just listed in 262, I don't think that will fly because they want to have the flexibility to add things there, just like they do with the uh, the other globals that they have. They have the workers, they have the window, they have node, um, on the other hand, and, and they have the flexibility to add things to that thing. And they want to be able to continue doing so. So okay. one thing that we couldn't include in that way would be worker in particular, because there's that's not that's not something that could be that could be forced on node, for example. Right. And it's not something, yeah. Um okay, so so let, let's 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 re-ask the question then starting with the methodology that we start with zero, and maybe this is just our general recommendation, is start with zero and then expand from there only as, um, you know, as is well motivated, uh, but really try to keep it down to the minimum. Yeah, let's, um, let's pick up one, let's say fetch. What are we going to do with fetch? Should we quickly get the red hands? I'm sorry, but it's a yeah. lot of red hands right now. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, allow me. Uh, Sala, please. Uh, yeah, just one of the uh, curious things is URL behavior, be behavior because it differs between browsers. Um, specifically, um, 
the use case where, um, for instance, a node, they use node colon specifier. Um, and then there's uh, something you would do in some platforms where a scheme um, would actually be treated as a path kind of scheme versus a non-path. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, even URL on its own becomes very tricky if you're going to layer it down and try to emulate the behavior of different platforms um, um, in realms, um, then you're going to run into, okay, so how do you hook into that? Um, how do you compel Apple to um, go against them not wanting anyone to touch URL? Um, this is, you're, but, talking about, this is, you're talking about the capital URL global object is actually yeah. differs in behavior between browsers? It does. Yes, and I, I had to kind of like hack uh, around it a little bit when I was doing some module tests a, a few years back um, just to use the FTP, I believe, or some other scheme to mock um, non-path schemes, right? Well, one thing that I want to clarify though, like um, we talked about this in the past. One of the use cases that we have in the past was uh, the, the portability of the shadow ROM, and we we essentially drop it midway there. Like shadow ROM is not there to be a portable system that you can that is guaranteed to get the same behavior across the board. That's not a use case. So if there is different behavior between different implementations and APIs that they install there, that should be fine. We we don't care much about it. Right, but you okay. could detect you could detect um, um, from there some, some additional information within the shadow realm. Yes. Right, and that's the case today. That's why we the shadow realm does not provide any guarantees um, about uh, uh, any hidden information or secrets of any kind. So it's just, we don't we don't have that guarantee. The, 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 the one thing that I do want to, the one implication about this URL difference that I do want to, to just get said, especially for the recording, is that given this platform difference between URL, I do not think that URL should be on the list of globals standardized by uh, TC39 in 262. Yeah, I agree, but, but that doesn't mean that they don't they don't put it into a shadow realm. No, I, under, I understand that. I just I just because because the conversation had previously we were enumerating text encoder, text decoder. I was including URL in that list. I just wanted to clarify that um, because I included URL in that list under the assumption that it was both powerless and portable. Well, the, the portability is a goal. They just haven't achieved it yet. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they're never going to. I, I, I'd like to point out that uh, even TC39 APIs behave differently on different platforms. Like as we've talked about in the past, the math, some of the math functions uh, have different results on different platforms. So uh, the goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that shape had sell. But in, in any case, I think uh, the, the, I want to be very clear that they, we have been working with them for now almost a year or so. Um, they have made significant changes into the specs to accommodate shadow ROMs, to be able to decorate uh, all the APIs that they have in such a way that they can easily describe whether or not this API will be in the shadow realm or not. Um, so the, the methodology there is like a, it's a tagging system where you can tag individual interfaces to determine whether or not they should be in, in different environments and Shadow Realm is one of them. Um, so assuming that all the things that the Shadow Realm will have when created are going to be specified in 262 goes explicitly against that work that we have done for a year. So there has to be a process where they can look at an API and inter an interface and decide whether or not it's going to be there. And, and that um, is where we are right now. I don't think it makes too much sense to try to push the other way uh, into 262 at this point. The only thing that they want is a methodology to determine whether or not they should target, tag the interface with 
Shadow Realm. So it can be included in Shadow Realm or it can be included everywhere. They have a asterisk if you want to put it everywhere. That's that's pretty much it. I see Alex's hand. Thank you, Chris. Um, just a point I wanted to make, um, nominating any particular API to be brought into ECMAScript is going to be a longer conversation, I think, than we have time for in this meeting. Um, I, I mean, we could easily take two or three meetings on that subject alone, no disrespect intended. Um, and it could be, I mean, we're, it could be URL, could be fetch, could be me trolling Mark and saying abort signal. Um, but I'm just saying that I don't think we're going to be able to cover that in this meeting alone and then continue with the rest of the TC39 post plenary. Yeah, no, I, I think the objective now is, is to do that. The objective is to come up with the methodology that they can use to determine whether or not they should tag the interface. And um, run through multiple of these cases. Uh, we have a list of some of them. We can go over some of them and you will clearly see that it has nothing to do with 262. Yeah, yeah. so I, I mean, to that point, um, the notion that 262 should make a list of uh, APIs that should be available on the global worries me because that would force non-web uh, implementations to uh, to offer those APIs. Uh, and I I mean, if we think an API should be in all implementations, I think 262 should just implement it or specify it. I mean, um, the, my second point is that, again, to go back to uh, what Carrie was just saying, um, I think the compromise we had made was that every global stays configurable so that if an environment decides to offer an API, we can uh, the, the user can just remove it. Right. And that, that, that was a compromise that, what, that was reached. Uh, so yeah, I understand coming up with guidelines on, on what they, they would be reasonable to include uh, is one thing, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to us because if we deem that an API that they decide to include uh, shouldn't actually be there. Uh, it can just be removed. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, and we would just need to be careful in the spec language. It's not just that it's configurable, but it's that it's actually deletable. An exotic object can describe a property as configurable and still refuse to delete it. Yeah, I think we have that in the, in the spec, in the, in the text, where we define the, the process of adding more things to the global. I think we have that, but we can double check. Matthew and I again can double check that. Okay. Yeah, great. On that, on that note, I think that what this ultimately boils down to is that there should be a web specification that makes this list for web vendors. Um, and that configurability bit allows us on TC39 on not to care too much. Yeah, especially if eventually we also get the list of intrinsics. That will be even easier for us to make the determination of which one is what. Um, so again, like I want to just run through a few of those that are interesting. Fetch is one of them. Console is another one. Um, uh, the we talk about some of the uh, errors and how to handle errors. That's a, a more complicated um conversation probably we can defer that for next week or so um yeah, we have to cover that at some point so if not today uh definitely yeah. another point but but for the globals itself it's just a matter of deciding what is the process for to make the determination whether or not it should it it's not it should be there whether or not it can be there um so, so my take on this is that we have that this isn't we aren't the right people to ask my take on this is that we are satisfied because we can delete anything. Um, and the criteria they probably ought to use is, um, yeah, put it all in there unless it makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> like, uh, I, I need to, there's something I don't, I just don't remember. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, like local storage, does local storage make sense in a in a shadow realm? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it, it, um, it, 
first of all, it, it could work because the shadow realm does not directly has an origin associated to it, but indirectly it does have it because you go all the way to the root window and the root window has an origin and therefore you might get access to the local storage. Um, so that's that's a, a, a good example of this ambiguity of whether or not we we want we want to have that there. Um, at some point we talk about uh, authority and and IO and and obviously that is also going to be complicated. I don't think they will agree on not having fetch there because fetch is a thing that a developer might want to use to do something. And if they don't have it, they have a very, very hard time fetching anything from outside. Okay. Okay, I need to, I need to be reminded of something about the Realm API. Uh, uh, what is the API for creating a Realm and what are the options that can be provided in that API? No options, just creation. No options uh, are going to be provided in the first version of it. And uh, it gives you back uh, two methods, evaluate and import value. Evaluates to evaluate is eval, basically, and indirect eval. And import value is import, but grabbing a specific um, specific uh, export name. Okay. Um, if you want to do fetch, you have to evaluate something there that you can call, giving a callback to it that gets wrapped. Then they can call that callback that goes onto the incubator. The incubator will do the fetch, do all okay. the things, because it cannot return a promise. It has to be transformed into a callable um, API. Uh, so they got they have to call the callback and provide another callback to it. Then you yeah. do the fetch, promise base, yada yada. Then you decide what kind of information you're going to share with them in which format, because it cannot be an object has to be only a primitive value. So you most likely will have to do some sort of gymnastics there to provide not only the source, but the metadata associated to it, um, how they provide you the methods that they want for the fetch is also complicated because it cannot be an object. So again, like it's just very, very difficult just to do yeah. a fetch. Um, it, what is the reason for not allowing fetch or not? No, in, in the past we talk about um, Shadow Realm IO as a way to give authority to it. And uh, if you have IO, then uh, you already have access to the outside world and the incubator doesn't really have a way to control you other than maybe evaluating some code that deletes the things that you don't want, which is possible. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's why I believe we say, well, fetch should be fine. Like fetch is, yeah. you, you don't need to block fetch. You, you might not need to block uh, local storage. Um, so yeah. Okay, let, I, let, me, let, let, me, let me make let me make a modest proposal. Um, the uh, that a, that for a given host, there's a set of things that it can provide by um, you know by magic by by you know host mechanism that it can provide uh, to the shadow global uh, like fetch um, uh, and then uh, the uh, creator uh, provides a list of the ones that they actually want to um, be created on the shadow uh, 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 yeah, that has to be from, from the list of candidates. That means that the, the shadow by default doesn't have any API. And if the way the, and furthermore, if the way that the creator uh, says which ones they want is by actually providing their own, then a creator that doesn't have fetch is not in a position to create a, sh a new shadow realm that does have fetch. Basically, if it's on, if it's on the, the list of magically supported ones, 
and the creator has it, then they can ask that it be created on the shadow that they're creating. So I have a few issues with that one. I have a few issues I uh, want to, to go into details. Uh, so the first issue is that um, in many cases, the creator of the realm is just evaluating code that it does not control uh, in the sense that it doesn't know the details of it. So it will be difficult to keep track of all the things that you need ordered than by error on trial, which is pretty bad. And you have to try to run and then you see, oh, wait, ah, this library that I'm using there, use this API, let me add it. And then- Well, I mean, the thing is, it doesn't matter if, if, the, if you're not willing to give the library mm -hmm. fetch access, then it doesn't matter whether it assumes it. If you're not willing to give it, then it no, will be- No, I'm talking about the case. I'm talking about the case where you, you want to get something done. You you want to evaluate some code there okay. in a shadow realm. The primary I goal see. not to limit you. It's just to, make, to run the code. And then it's trial, it's error on trial at that point. The okay. the second the second note about this is that what happened if I replace, I polyfill some of these features. If I polyfill some of these features, then how can I give the actual right down to the secondary okay. you know, shadow wrong. So, okay. so, let me, so let me bring up a related problem then. Given that fetch, so given that we, we've solved the first level problem by just making fetch configurable so that after creating the shadow, we can delete it. Uh, then there's the second, you know, the secondary problem that, uh, okay, the shadow has been denied fetch but the shadow can reclaim the ability to do fetch by creating a new shadow. Well, you can deny shadow realm inside. Uh, you can create it, it, you deny it. We talk about that, yeah. But if you want to allow shadow realm, no, that you, require you to, uh, to wrap it. So, and that, that is cumbersome for sure. Yeah, that, Mark, you, you replace the shadow realm constructor the same way yeah. that you, you, you remove fetch. You yeah, I know the text. Okay. Problem. Yeah. And when we when we shim locked realms we'll uh, do that. on top of realms, that's exactly what we have to yeah, do. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's annoying, and we have to do it for errors if we want to do uh, error censorship. And I think I think at this point, like anybody that's interested in limiting uh, capabilities of a shadow realm is, is just going to have to deal with a way of recursively uh, patching shadow realm. Yep. I think that that closes out our topic and gives us some time between meetings. Um, thank you for everyone, everyone for coming um, and I'll stop the recording. I, I, one quick comment on, on this, like the main problem I see with uh, with the recursively patching is that it requires an evaluation uh, and and that has to be synchronous so we can't even rely on a, on on a module that would some somehow be allowed by csv uh and so you, you you can you can you can you can manage if they if they want to use if they want to use uh import value you can also replace import value to do your promise before their promise no no, no. what i what i mean is that um Shadow Realm creation is synchronous. If it requires evaluating something to uh, modify uh, the environment inside the Shadow Realm, that has to be done synchronously as well. Uh, uh, not necessarily because for them to be able to do evaluate, they need to have the proper um, CSP rules in this case to be able to do evaluate. And if they can do evaluate, we can do evaluate. So we can batch the so uh, what I would say, uh, the way I will implement it is that you, I, I allow you to create a shadow realm, but I'm not patching yet until you either call it evaluate or import. Then I do it. And if you call- okay, so Basically, you would deny access to shadow realm API unless you can evaluate your own uh, bootstrap. Exactly, yeah. So- Okay, fair. Yeah. Fair. Okay, so uh, Chris, can you add for the next meeting a topic related to error control on Shadow Realm? It will take probably 30 minutes, but it's, it's quite uh, interesting, I would say.
which which facet of it the uh unhandled uh and yeah yeah uh, handles and yeah 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 I, yeah i think there's a way but it's it's a funny one all right i'll uh, i'll scribble it in okay let me just also uh mention at some meeting we should talk about um whether we should consider standardizing the console API as part of 262. Console is really a fascinating little thing and it really is universal across platforms pretty much. Yeah, it was funny <laughs> because I, when, I was start, when I started trying the Safari implementation of Shadow Realm, we didn't have console and it was very painful. Yeah. Anybody remember Firebug? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or oh, Fire, yeah. Firebug Lite. Oh, I, I remember when if you had a script that called console and the uh, and the dev tools were not open, uh, your program crashed. Like that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in in my brief tenure at Apple, the. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I spent more time filing bugs against Safari 2 than doing at my actual work. And uh, one of them was that you could induce Safari to crash by calling console log with a non-console receiver. It was glorious. <laughs> I also filed the one where, hey, it's like, maybe I need, maybe, maybe the web needs more than 99 stack frames. <laughs> the common JS prototypes I was writing at the time uh, required 14 stacks per nested require. <laughs> this is heinous. Oh, but that was also with the uh, with my <laughs> the, the reduced with blocks. So there was a with block for every um, import star. And each of those required a stack frame. Uh, anyhow. Yes, it's uh, it's ten fifty five. Great meeting. Thanks. I will add to the to the next. <laughs>